them by the back door as you're heading out later. Uh, just to highlight that there's no 5pm service today. There hasn't been for a couple of weeks, but it's still worth saying, do not come at 5pm. There will not be anybody here. You will not get fed. <laughs> uh, we do still have our prayer meeting. That's on Wednesday at half past seven, and it would be lovely to see as many people as possible gathering for that. Uh, also highlight that while we've not got any summer activities on today, uh, next Sunday we have our trip to Helensborough, which last year was very popular. Lots of people fancy a wee chippy by the beach. Uh, so if you would like to come along to that, you're very welcome. Uh, we're going to meet at Helensborough at 4pm. If you're able to get there by yourself, great. Uh, if you don't have a lift or if you can't organise one, please try and organise one first yourself. And if you can't do that, Greg would love to help you. Uh, that's all for this week. So, boys and girls, can anybody remember what book of the Bible we've been looking at? That didn't sound like one of the boys or girls. Yeah? 
Daniel. Daniel, yeah. Uh, and in the book of Daniel, we have been learning to hold Jesus as the most precious thing. Uh, and so we're going to sing a song just now. Actually, no, let's pray. We're going to pray just now. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are eternal, that you cannot be shaken. Uh, Father, that those who trust in you have certain help. We rejoice today in your loving care, that you hold us close and surround us in your compassion. We come before you as our maker and judge, as our God and king, and we're aware of our rebellion before you. We confess that throughout our lives we reject what you have said is good and embrace that which is evil. We bring ourselves before you and throw ourselves on your grace, on the grace given by Jesus' blood shed for us. Father, we ask that today you would heed our prayer, have mercy upon us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. And we ask that you would turn our hearts to worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're now going to sing a song that celebrates how precious Jesus is to those true believers. Uh, All I once held dear. Again, please stand as the music starts. Bible reading just now, continuing through the book of Daniel. Uh, if you would like a Bible, can you stick your hand straight up in the air? I know it's on the screen, but you will find it l- helpful later on to have an actual Bible in your hands. Uh, just keep your hand up in the air. Janice will bring you one. Uh, and I've asked 
Greg and Gillian to come up and read Daniel chapter 2 to us. Um, so it's Daniel chapter 2 and the reading starts on page 884 of the Blue uh, Bibles. Uh, while you're turning to that, I forgot to say to you, at the at Helensborough next Sunday, we'll meet um, just beside, just on the promenade, but just after the swimming pool, if that makes sense. So there's lots of parking around the swimming pool where you can uh, park a car, or and then we'll meet just where the promenade begins. I think that makes sense. I don't think there's... Okay, excellent. Um, so, like I said, Daniel chapter 2. It's a big long reading, which is why Ewan's roped in uh, two of us. It starts on page 884, and we're picking up this story from last week. It says there, In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell them, to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honour. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, Let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death. And men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, Why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerner. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I found a man among the exiles from Judah 
who can tell the king what his dreams mean. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that passed through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that had struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise, inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honour and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego chief ministers over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Amen. Oh, there was an amazing truth in that story, wasn't there, that where nobody else could tell the king what his dream was, was Daniel was able to because God had told him and God is able to do all kinds of incredible things uh, and we're going to sing a song just now that celebrates just that God can do anything and I've asked Greg and Gillian to stay on the platform because they're going to help us with the actions
So let's stand together and we'll sing God Can Do Anything. Don't shove him in a corner, don't you limit what he can do Don't put him in a box, don't shove him in a corner Don't you limit what he can do God can do anything, anything at all God can do anything, anything at all Nothing is too big for him and nothing is too small God can do anything, anything at all Don't put him in a box, don't shove him in a corner Don't you limit what he can do Don't put him in a box, don't shove him in a corner Don't you limit what he can do God can do anything Don't shove him in the corner, don't you limit what he can do Don't put him in the box, don't shove him in the corner Don't you limit what he can do God can do anything, anything at all God can do anything, anything at all Nothing is too big for him, like nothing is too small God can do anything, anything at all Don't put him in the box, don't shove him in the corner Don't you limit what he can do Don't put him in the box, don't shove him in the corner Don't you limit what he can do Just before we take a look at that story again, let's pray and ask for God's help. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have spoken through your word, that you have revealed all that we need to know about you in your word. Father, please help us just now to see more of you and worship Jesus because of it. Amen. 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 Okay, I'm going to start by asking you a question and you might need to think about it a little bit. Okay, you ready? I know it's early, but try. Uh, I want you to think of the things that you think drive history. Okay, so if you think of human history, of all the events that happen, what are the big things, the big factors that make history happen? Anybody got any ideas? Man's lust for power. Man's lust for power. I was going to write them down, but that's a bit wordy. Power. Power? (laughs) Yeah, anything else? Money. Yeah, money, good. Just shout them out. Wars. Yeah. People. Yeah, I guess. People. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Anybody lived through any plagues recently? <laughs> uh, not so much in Glasgow, but natural disaster. I'm not going to even try and spell it, but... Earth, yeah, that is a natural disaster. <laughs> not very confident I can spell it, though. Um, you see, there's all these things that we know drive history, right? These big, momentous events that get recorded in history books because that tells us what's happened and why it's happened. Um, and the truth is that what you think drives history will impact your outlook, right? Follow with me. So if you think that history is entirely random, that anything can happen at any time, you will be pretty pessimistic, okay? Because, well, anything could happen. Your life and everything that you interact with is completely out of your control. But if you think that there is something in control, maybe people, maybe money, something that has its hand on all of human development, you will probably be a little bit more optimistic. It will, how you see history will impact your outlook. And it really stems back to who is on the throne. See, that's what we've been asking the way through the book of Daniel, isn't it? See, remember the people in Daniel's day, they have been taken away from their home. They've been carted off into exile, into this foreign power. And they must have been wondering to themselves, who is really on the throne? Anybody tell me what that is? The throne. Yeah, that's a bit easier, isn't it? Um. And we need to see that those who are on the throne, there are certain things that they have. Uh, So people who are on the throne, they can do whatever they want, right? 
They're, in, they're powerful. They can do that. Uh, they're in control. They have authority over things, yeah? And they will know certain things. Because they're on the throne, because they're in charge, they will be able to do those things. Uh, and one of the things, I'm glad somebody said people, because one of the things that our world loves to look to is powerful leaders. And we think history is just a development of really powerful people uh, who decide what happens around them, who make history. And so far in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar has been pretty powerful. Uh, he has been introduced to us as the powerful king of Babylon who swept into Jerusalem with an army and conquered it. He has been the one who has dominated everybody around him. He has been set up as this powerful, powerful man. And yet as we look at verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar looks pretty weak, doesn't he? If you've got a Bible, look with me at verse 1. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he couldn't sleep. Has anybody ever had that? You got bad dreams, can't sleep. You ate too much cheese the night before. Yeah, a few of you. Uh, so Nebuchadnezzar has had this dream that confuses him. He finds he can't get back to sleep because he's so worried about the dream. He keeps running it over in his head again, thinking, what, what was that about? Why was I shown that? Why? What was that meaning of that dream? And because he can't sleep, he decides, well, I want to know. He thinks, this dream, it, it must have been given to me as a vision. I want to understand what the dream means. And so follow along with the story. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers and astrologers to tell him what he dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Right, Nebuchadnezzar, he, he calls everybody he can think of. He thinks, ah, the astrologers, they study the stars, they'll be able to tell me. Or maybe the magicians who do magic tricks, maybe they can tell me. I'll get on all my wisest people, the university professors, the school teachers. I'll bring them all in front of me and surely one of them can tell me what my dream was. Because he adds a challenge, doesn't he? Did you get that in the story? That, that Nebuchadnezzar doesn't just say, tell me what the dream means. He almost says, you have to prove your credentials by telling me what the dream was first. And all the magicians and astrologers and enchanters, they go, but I can't do that. I can't guess what your dream is. No, no, you tell me the dream and then I'll tell you what it means. And Nebuchadnezzar goes, no, you're just trying to buy time. If I tell you my dream, you'll make up an explanation. So to prove to me that you can do what you say you can do, you're going to tell me the dream and then you're going to tell me what it means. But ultimately, that gets him nowhere. The astrologers, the enchanters, all of the clever people of the kingdom, they aren't able to tell him what he wants to know. Look down at verse 10, what they end up answering him. The astrologers answered the king, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. No king can do it. There is only one way. Look at verse 11. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods. And they do not live among the humans. Do you see there that, that Nebuchadnezzar has all of the power. He's the most powerful man on earth. And yet when he's kept up by bad dreams, nothing he does can get him the answers that he wants. He can bring in all the cleverest men on earth. He can ask them questions. He can threaten them day and night. But nothing in his power is able to bring him his answers. And that really tells us that we shouldn't put confidence in human wisdom, human power. Because it has limits. There are simply things that we cannot do. Uh, can I get three volunteers up on the platform? Stick your hand. Be brave. Yeah? Zion? Do you want to come up the front? Yeah? Two more? I'll just start pecking on people. Yeah, come on. Yeah, Alistair. Okay, Zion. Very simple. I want you to do something for me, okay? okay? Do you think you can do it? You don't know what it is yet. Why would you not? <laughs> okay, I want you to stand on that spot and touch the roof. <laughs> just 
Stand where you are and just, just touch the roof. Not quite. Oh, you can't do it, can you? That's okay. Go and sit down. Thank you. Okay. Alistair. How tall are you? Sixty what? <laughs> okay. Okay, and um, I think you should be a bit taller. I want you to control your height. Uh, so if you can be that tall for me. You can't. No, try. Come on. No, because that's just jumping. Can you not do it? No. Oh man. Okay, go and sit down. And um, you know, I want you to tell me what's in this box. No, there is something in the box. Something? Yeah, there is something in the box. <laughs> well done. It is a something. I want you to tell me what the something is. I don't know. What? Make a guess. A box? It is a box. No, inside of this. No. It's a tube of toothpaste. <laughs> okay, do you want one more chance? No, no, you, okay, go on. All right, I want you to tell me what my dream was last night. Can? Why not? Because I don't know. Okay, well, go and sit down. Thank you. <laughs> and those are kind of silly examples, but you see that there are just things that we cannot do in our power. Uh, there are things that we just can't control, and there are things that we just cannot know, no matter how hard we try, no matter how much we want to be that powerful, that knowledgeable, we face it all the time, don't we? Our own inadequacy, the inadequacy of what we're able to do. We face it all the time when there are just things that we don't know, things that we can't control. We can't control what happens around us in the world. And we can't do, we can't do whatever we would like. I'm sure we would all love to be able to stand on that spot and touch the roof. But we can't. And Nebuchadnezzar finds himself in the exact same situation. He cannot do. He cannot force his enchanters to tell him what his dream was. He cannot control them in the way that he wants. And ultimately he cannot know what his dream means. All this is just telling Nebuchadnezzar again and again. You might be the most powerful man in Babylon but you're not really on the throne. You are not as in control as you would like to be. There are things that you simply cannot do. And in response to that, Nebuchadnezzar decides that he's going to kill all of the enchanters, all of the wise men. He decides to put them to death. But notice that even that won't tell him what his dream means. Even after he's killed all of the wise people for not telling him, still he will be left in the dark about what his dream means. And so the order is given. People go out to gather in all the wise men so that they can be killed. And so wise men come to get Daniel, who's counted among those kind of wise people who are going to be killed as a result. And look at how Daniel knows exactly where to turn. How Daniel knows where he can trust in this situation. Look with me at verse 14. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh degree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Uh, do you see there that that Daniel's being threatened with death. And what is his reaction? Does Daniel start screaming and kicking and complaining? Does Daniel start chucking his toys out the pram going, that's not fair, you can't do that? No. He, we're told he speaks with wisdom and tact and he asks for more time. And it's what we were learning about last week. He is calmly living as an exile. Even though the things around him are unfair, he still treats the people around him with dignity. He is still peaceful as he lives as an exile. And so he asks for more time, hoping and knowing that God is able, that he will reveal the dream to him. 
And then we're told God reveals to him what only God was able to. Verse 19, look at it with me. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Isn't that incredible? What the wise men of Babylon could not possibly do, God just gives to Daniel. Tells us that we can depend on God who does give understanding. And Daniel, in response to being told what the dream was, he he sings this praise of God. And look at it with me. It's there in verse 20. Uh, Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Now, let's go back to this. Is God able to do what Daniel asks? Yes. yes. Again, these aren't trick questions. Is God able to control? Yes. Yeah, he can give Daniel the dream. Is God able to know? Yes. Yes, right? God is able to do all of those things that Nebuchadnezzar could not possibly do, God shows to Daniel. This song then, it celebrates that God is the one who is on the throne. He is the one who can do amazing things. It tells us to put our hope in God because he can do anything. I don't know what all of you are facing today. I don't know what situations are going on in your life. But we can look at this chapter in Daniel and be secure that God has his hand on that situation. Because even in Babylon, God was still in control for his people and his people can still look to him. He was still on the throne. So last thing, third thing, we get Daniel's or Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So follow along in the story with me. Daniel goes to Nebuchadnezzar. Look with me at verse 26. So Daniel goes before Nebuchadnezzar, says, I have your dream. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Daniel is able to share this vision. And it is an incredible vision of things that are yet to happen. And I think we're told that that it's given for Nebuchadnezzar to understand what is going to happen. It is given for Daniel so that he can see what is going to happen in the future. And ultimately it is given for us so that we can better understand what God is doing through history. So in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he sees... A very funny looking statue. Has anybody ever dreamed of a statue like that? Have you, Zion? (laughs) Cool. Uh, So he dreams about this statue. And it's a statue made up of loads of different layers. Uh, So we're told first that the head is made of shiny gold. And then the, the torso and arms, they're made of still pretty nice, but not quite as nice silver. And then moving down that kind of midriff section, uh, that's made out of bronze. Still pretty good, but, you know, getting less exciting. And then that bottom bit, it's made out of iron and eventually clay is mixed into the statue. It's a kind of multi-level statue. So Nebuchadnezzar has dreamed of this statue and he's, he's maybe trying to go, okay, what's, what's going on with that? Why am I being shown these different bits? Uh, but then something happens to the statue where this rock comes in from heaven and it's a rock that's been carved by God and it strikes the statue And the statue gets knocked down to pieces. And then as Daniel or Nebuchadnezzar watches, the rock turns into a mountain that covers the whole earth. Now that's what none of the enchanters could do, isn't it? Is tell Daniel, is tell Nebuchadnezzar that dream. Um, It really wasn't fair to ask Dino what my dream was. Do you think you could have guessed that? No, that has to have come from God, right? That has to have been revealed to Daniel from God. 
because there's no way that a human being could know that. And so Nebuchadnezzar is nodding there in his throne now. He's going, yep, you've been able to tell me the dream. Now what does it all mean? And incredibly, again, Daniel is able to explain what is going on. Look at verse 36. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. And so Daniel reveals that this vision, it was all about consecutive kingdoms that will crumble. And so he says that the gold, the head, well, that was Nebuchadnezzar himself. That was a picture of what he was like. He was majestic in his power. He was gold. But then Daniel says that, well, after the gold of Babylon, there is going to come another kingdom that is less powerful, just like silver is worth less than gold. And then after the silver kingdom, there's going to come a bronze kingdom that's going to be less majestic again. And then after that, it's going to come one made of iron that is strong, but, but it will be brittle. And that during that time, there will come something that will smash these statue to pieces, all these kingdoms piling up on top of each other. And the thing that smashes it to pieces will become a mountain that covers the whole earth. They will all be destroyed by God's stone. Uh, this tells us that the mightiest kingdoms are dwarfed by what God is doing in his world. God is building his kingdom. Now think of how humbling that must have been for Nebuchadnezzar to hear. As he sits there on his golden throne in his golden palace, thinking he has all the power to be told. First of all, your kingdom is going to fall. And then that kingdom is going to fall. And then there's going to be another kingdom. And then eventually it will all get knocked to the ground because God's eternal kingdom will take their place. That's humbling for Nebuchadnezzar to hear, but it's amazing for Daniel to hear, isn't it? In exile to go, this kingdom that has destroyed us, it is going to get brought low. This all helps us to see that God is working through history to establish his eternal kingdom. And look with me at verse 44. To see there that what will last is this mountain that God is building. In the time of those kings, the last kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. What will last is that mountain. And we can see by looking at the rest of the Bible that what fulfills that promise perfectly is the Lord Jesus. And if we see that the mountain that destroys these is Jesus, that might help us to put together what some of the rest of this is going on. Do you see in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar starts off on top. He is a powerful king. He can do whatever he likes. But within Daniel's own lifetime, the Babylonian Empire will be replaced by the Persians. Uh, the Medo-Persians, they come in and they shatter Babylon. They take charge of all of their territories. And then after the time of the Old Testament being written, the Persians themselves would be defeated by the Greeks. A guy called Alexander the Great would come along, who would destroy the kingdom of Persia and take its place. And then after the Greeks, there would come another kingdom, uh, the Romans, who would come in and dominate all of these lands and take charge. And you see, I think that matters because it is in the context of the Romans that Jesus Christ lived and died in. Just listen to what Luke, in the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse 1 says. In those days, Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor, issued a decree, a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Jesus is born in the context of Rome. It is that final kingdom of iron and clay that Jesus comes into. Later on, Jesus would be crucified on the orders of Pontius Pilate, another Roman. Jesus lived and died in the shadow of one of the greatest empires in history. And he did this to gather people to himself. Jesus fulfills that stone that comes along that shatters these earthly kingdoms, that takes their place. 
He does this to gather a people to himself. Because he was heralding in his worldwide empire, the kingdom of God. Just listen to how Jesus starts his ministry in Mark chapter 1 verse 14. It says, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. See, with Jesus' arrival, all of these kingdoms that looked so powerful, they are going to be replaced by something far better. The eternal kingdom of God. God's kingdom will take the place of all of them, and it becomes that mountain that covers the whole earth. With those words in Mark, Jesus initiates his universal church. That body of people who have been saved by him, who have had their sins forgiven by what Jesus has done for them on the cross. And as people are saved, they are added into the kingdom of God. They, they become a part of that mountain that covers the whole earth. And the incredible news for us this morning is that Jesus invites us to be a part of it. The church is the mountain that is promised in Daniel. Jesus' eternal rule, including all of those who are saved. And what is at the center of that empire-shattering kingdom is the cross. Because it is how sinners like you and me can become a part of it. Here's a thought for you. The church, universal, is the only institution that will last forever. Okay? Uh, give me some things that seem pretty permanent in our world. Okay, just shout them out. British monarchy. Seems pretty permanent. It's not. Jesus will be king forever. Uh, Bank of England? Seems permanent. It's not. Jesus will reign forever. Go on, give me another one. Looks permanent. It's not. Jesus will reign forever. Yeah? Do you get it? All of these things that surround us in our world... Things that would look like Babylon and Persia and Greece and Rome. They all look powerful, but they are nothing compared to what God is doing in the world. You and I could spend our lives accumulating wealth and power in this world, but it would all disappear to nothing in the face of what Jesus is doing. So we should be putting confidence in him, trust in that one king. Nothing else that you interact with in your life will be as certain as God's worldwide church. Even when it faces danger and destruction on all sides. Because it is what God is building through history. And see, I think this really helps us to think about history, especially as we look at it going on around us. Because it's easy, isn't it, to get, to get emotional, to get upset about the things that we see around us. Isn't it? We can start to panic really easily and go, what, what earth is going on in our world? Why are these terrible things happening that seem out of our control? And we can look to things like these and see, well, that seems to be what's in control. That seems to be what's happening. But the book of Daniel tells us that, no, none of those things matter because God is on the throne. Empires will continue to rise and fall. It is part of God's design. But even when they look stable, they are nothing compared to what he is doing. To help you understand, Babylon, at the time of Nebuchadnezzar, was going through its golden age. It had been around for about a millennium and a half. It looked permanent. Uh, to be clear, the British monarchy in its current state is less than a thousand years old. Babylon was older than anything that you or I have ever interacted with. And yet within Daniel's lifetime, it would be wiped off the face of the earth. Even within many of our lifetimes, most of us will have seen the British Empire, which must have looked very solid a century ago, crumble to nothing. And these things just tell us, don't put your confidence in earthly institutions. Because ultimately we get to be a part of God's eternal mountain. And that will last forever. But that is what Nebuchadnezzar seems to realize at the end of the chapter. He seems to recognize that God is higher than himself. Look at verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel. Does everybody know what prostrate is? Dan, can you come up here and lie prostrate? 
Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar falls down like that before God. Thank you, Dan. That was very good. <laughs> King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. How amazing is that? That the man who thought he was in control is humbled by what the God of Daniel is able to do. And Daniel then gets rewarded within Babylon. He gets lifted to a high position because he can reveal dreams. And I think you see a little bit of an echo of the story of Joseph and Pharaoh in that. One of God's people living in a foreign land but being lifted high because of what God is able to do through him. And it tells us that we shouldn't despise the world around us. Even when we see that it is godless, we shouldn't be entirely antagonistic. But Daniel's primary loyalty remains to the one true kingdom. He belongs to God's kingdom, but he's happy to live in Nebuchadnezzar's. And so we ask ourselves, what is God doing in history? Through all that we see around us, what is God doing? Well, it is this. God is building his eternal kingdom. All around us, that is the most significant thing happening on this planet right now. Is God saving people to his kingdom? And so where do you think you and I should be invested in this life? Where should we see most of our worth? Where should we see our efforts going into? Is it in things that will not last? Things that will one day crumble? Or is it into what God is doing? Because we should be invested into that kingdom that will never end. That kingdom that is being built as people are saved by Jesus. Uh, we began by thinking about these things that drive history. Big events. I want to finish by telling you one of the most significant announcements that has ever been made. It was made by a travelling preacher in a backwards country on the outer limits of the Roman Empire. But it was fulfilling this prophecy of Daniel. As Jesus said, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. That is the most important news that we will ever hear. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the one who is in control of all things. That Lord, as much as human beings like to think we are in charge, you are the only one on the throne. And Father, we thank you that through history you have done that incredible work of building your kingdom. That Lord, even though we are far from you, we get to be a part of it because of your kindness shown in Jesus. Father, please help us to have priorities that are shaped by what you are doing in the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing again another song that just helps us to focus on Jesus and what he has done. Christ is made the sure foundation. And so we'll stand together as the music starts.
one of the best ways that we can respond to Scripture is with Scripture. Uh, and so we're, we spoke today of that vision of a mountain that Nebuchadnezzar had. And we saw that it was made up from uh, people across the world taking part in that universal church, part of that kingdom around the throne. And so I've asked Addy to read a passage from Revelation that picks up on that vision of people gathered around the throne of Christ. Revelation chapter 7, from verse 9 to 17. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude, that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing round the throne and round the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, this in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shatter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they taste. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching eat. Verse 17. And the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every fear from their eyes. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you this morning. We appreciate your Lordship. We know that indeed you are God on the throne. Not just on the throne of our fears, of politics, of life, but also of the throne of our own life. Lord, we thank you for being on the throne, for leading, guiding, chattering us, for giving us this time, because it is you that through you we live and move and have our entire being. We say, Father, be the exalted this morning. Thank you for all we've done. Thank you for the people that you are using to feed your flocks. Thank you for the pastors, for the ones that you are using to see that salvation is preached across the universe and nations in places like this day and beyond this day. We thank you and we pray, Father, that you will strengthen them. You will strengthen this servant of yours, wherever they are, the ones that missed us, the ones in the world that are laboring for the cause of the gospel, we pray, Father, you will continue to strengthen them. You will give them mouth and wisdom that no mouth can gain say in the name of Jesus. We pray, Father, that you will help them, that they will grow more in the fruit of your spirit. Lord, they will grow more in the fruit of your spirit. They will grow more in bearing fruit for the kingdom. And they will grow more and abide in you every day of their life. I will pray, Father, everything that concerns them as they are laboring for the cause of you. We pray, Father, you will strengthen their family, you strengthen their household, you strengthen their union, and you strengthen the body of Christ at large. You strengthen the church of God in the name of Jesus. As we pray, Father, for these ones, we say all things we work together for their good in the name of Jesus. You will help them that they will take root downward and bring fruit upward. Thank you, Father, for in Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. 
And so we're going to finish by singing a song that gives us an amazing vision of that unified praise of God's people gathered around him. Uh, we're going to sing it unaccompanied together. It's Psalm 100, all people that on earth do dwell. So please stand together and we'll sing. Oh. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.